John chapter 12 and verses 12 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, and that they had done these things to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Well, again, welcome to our Palm Sunday service. Um, a day when we, we celebrate when Jesus you know, rode into Jerusalem and the people cried Hosanna and laid palm branches on the road, welcoming him as a king. Let's look at the story again uh, as we find it in the passage read in John chapter 12. Uh, now, this, this in many ways is a very strange passage. Let me illustrate by way of contrast. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The, the Pelican Brief or read the book. It's by John Grisham. It's a classic John Grisham novel. There's been a, a conspiracy. There's an oil company trying to pollute the Gulf of Mexico. A young law student called Darby Shaw has uncovered the conspiracy and she's trying to expose this multinational company for what they are. They're not happy. They don't take this lying down. And so the company have arranged for the killing of two Supreme Court judges. Not only that, Darby Shaw's mentor and professor is assassinated also. They're out to get her. And so she, she runs from them and she uses all the classic uh, tactics that you would use if you were running from the mob. She changes her name. She changes her appearance by cutting her hair. She changes her clothes. She doesn't use the credit card, but cash only. She goes from New Orleans to New York City to D.C., trying everything to avoid exposure by this group of people. Here we find, and this is the unusual thing in John chapter 12, Jesus is doing the exact opposite. It's almost as if he wants to get caught. We know that the Pharisees are pursuing him. We know that the Pharisees want to kill him. Now, the interesting thing is that up until then, he had been quiet. There's that verse in the Bible that says, he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the street. As soon as there was a crowd, Jesus always seemed to withdraw into the quiet place. He liked to be low profile. He liked to work under the radar. And indeed, he very often taught his people quietly. That, that was his hallmark. He was against any ostentatious show of power. He was meek and wild. This was the way of the suffering servant. And yet we find here, uh, chapter, uh, verse 12, the next day a great crowd had come for the festival. They took branches and went out to him and met him, shouting. And it seems as if Jesus is not discouraging this. And so it starts a whole chain of a reaction. Verse 19, the Pharisees see, say, see how the whole world has gone after him. So what we have here is Jesus, as it were, beginning this worldwide movement, which is absolutely unstoppable. This is the point of no going back. He's heading to the cross. He's staked his claim, and there is no way anything is going to be changed. So as we look at this Palm Sunday passage uh, together, I just want us to notice three things, maybe three unusual things about this passage. The first thing here is that large, noisy crowds do not always equal spiritual vitality. Now, can you picture the scene? 
Jesus, if he had a PR consultant, would have been thrilled. If he had a publicist working for him, all his dreams had come true. That he was entering into Jerusalem. One account says this was the time of the Passover, that there would be over two million people packed together in that tiny little city. Josephus, an early writer, said that there was 256,500 lambs slaughtered for the Passover. We read in this passage also that he had just raised a man called Lazarus from the dead. His stock was high. People in Jerusalem heard that he was coming. They poured out uh, into the east gate and the west gate. The two crowds would come together. They took palm branches and they shouted, Hosanna. Uh, Hosanna, all, all these things were really showing that Jesus was at the very top of his game here. He had never been so popular. Now, from a, a normal perspective, from a kind of worldly perspective, if you like, this was a great day. They were waving palm branches. Now, that was highly suggestive because in Psalm 92, uh, palm branches speak there of strength and vigor. It's a symbol, isn't it? Uh, Psalm 92 again speaks of the vitality, the strength of the people of God. Leviticus 23:40. It speaks here of, of royal splendor. It's regal splendor. It's part of the, the Feast of Tabernacles as well. It speaks of joy. There's a sense that from now on, things can only get better. You can almost hear the music in the background. Things can only get better. It really, really is amazing. And what, when John is writing here, John, who wrote the Gospels, there's actually almost two feasts in one. You've got Passover, which speaks of the coming Messiah. And you've also got the Hanukkah stuff going on, the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, that's when you were an anointed king. The, the symbolism of the two feasts is present in that one passage here in, in verses 12 onwards. So you've got the idea here of kingship. Hanukkah was the feast where the king was anointed. And so he is seen as Messiah and he is seen as king. The crowd said, here he is, the one who was going to smash the, the yoke of Roman oppression. The great enemy was going to be destroyed. Here was one who was going to crush the oppressors. Here was the great liberator. Here was the massive military man. And so, again, it seemed as if from an outward point of view that this was the very high point of the ministry of Jesus. And yet he does things in such a counterintuitive way. They wanted a warrior. He brought peace. They wanted a killer. But it was him who was going to be killed. Matthew's gospel said that they called him the son of David. Hosanna means help now, save me now. And again, it spoke of being a Messiah. Their Messiah was earthbound and their Messiah was political. They thought that their Messiah was one who would only answer earthly expectations. Look at verse 17 and verse 18. Now the crowd that was with them when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised from the dead continued to spread the word. Uh, many people, because they'd heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. They'd heard all these things. They thought that they was going to meet all their earthly, political, messianic expectations. Yeah, a large crowd doesn't always mean spiritual life and spiritual vitality. The crowds were there, quite frankly, to get from Jesus what they wanted not what they needed. The crowds were crying for him because they thought in different terms. They just didn't get it. They just didn't understand that his message was not the message of a revolution of bloodshed. At least it was, but the blood was going to be shed by him, not by his enemies. I wonder what about us? They say that over 80% they make decisions to follow Jesus 
fall away at. I don't know where they get that statistic. You know, 84% of statistics are invented anyway, aren't they? But what we often find here is that people want a relationship with Jesus for what they can get out of it. Maybe it's to heal the pain of the past, and that's perfectly legitimate. Maybe it's to be free from an addiction or some economic problem or some illness. Maybe it's to get some sort of warm feeling. But Jesus is saying, that's not why I came. I didn't come to bring earthly prosperity. I didn't come to be a human fixer. I came to break the power of sin. I came to be a redeemer. I came into your life so that you would have a relationship with God, that our sins may be forgiven and our sins may be atoned for. Remember what the Philippine jailer cried out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And you know what's really scary here? The same crowds that lined the street saying, Hosanna, he is the king. The same crowds who made the noise were a few days later saying, crucify him, crucify him. We want Barabbas. How quickly shall love turns to hate if it doesn't get its own way? The question this morning is, what am I looking out for in my relationship with Jesus? Am I looking just for something to be fixed in my life? Or am I wanting my sins to be forgiven? Am I wanting a relationship to God? Do I, see, do, do I want him for who he is? Do I want to follow Jesus for his beauty, for his loveliness, simply for who he is, rather than what I can get out of it? And so you're seeing here, yeah, it's a big crowd, there's a lot of noise, but they just don't get it. They just don't understand him. They don't see him for who he is. So that's the first thing we see. Big crowds do not equal spiritual vitality. The second thing may be Jesus may not be our sort of king. I, I just love verse 14. It's quite effective Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Now, here's a king, here's a crowd rather, expecting a king with all the trappings of royalty. You've got the palm trees, you've got the cries, and here he comes riding on a donkey. Even in today's culture, a donkey is a comic figure. You imagine a donkey at the beach. You imagine a donkey there just, you know, as old horse rambling along the beach. Um, can you imagine, you know, it's a, a 50th or 60th anniversary of the coronation of Her Majesty the Queen Horse Guards Parade is lined with people. And all of a sudden, the queen comes along riding a rusty old bike. It would be humiliating. Remember Lord of the Rings, uh, Gandalf, uh, the bearer of the ring. Gandalf calls for Shadowfax, who is the lord of all horses. Jesus, who is the creator of the world, the possessor of all power, comes riding on a donkey. He is a king like none other. He is a king who takes a humble position. He's saying, I am a king, but I'm not your sort of king. He's painting from a very different palette. His kingship is of a different order. And indeed, if they knew their Bibles, they would see that. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 18 says this. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. This is not just to teach humility, but we see here that Jesus was a humble person. Jesus wasn't simply an example of humility. Jesus epitomized all that uh, humility was. He is a special sort of king. The donkey spoke, 
of peace. This is not just a kind of, you know, anti fazling nuclear submarine peace. This is anti-nuclear submarine type of, you know, peace camp peace. It is bigger than that. It is a peace which reverses all the fall of Eden. It's a peace which comes to bring us peace with God, but a peace which will restore the heavens and the earth. You really need to go to Zechariah chapter 9 to see what Jesus is teaching here. Now, what is happening here has got massive implications for us. As a peace bringer, He's not a zealot. He's coming to bring peace to the nations. He's coming to bring peace by dying on the cross because he's on his way to Jerusalem. The death of death is going to be accomplished by the death of Jesus on the cross. And indeed, the passage makes the point here that Jesus organized his own death that Jesus set the time, that Jesus set the agenda. That's why he came in such a showy way, because he's basically saying, the time has now come. Here, here I am. Take me. Here, he is the silent king. He is in control of every situation. Just as the wind and the waves obey him, so here the people are drawn by this invisible power. He gave himself willingly. He is that sort of king. But the third thing we see in the passage here is that genuine Christianity is always challenging to the world. Genuine Christianity is always challenging to the world. As far as the Pharisees were concerned, this was getting absolutely out of control. The Pharisees liked to control religious affairs. Um, here was an unauthorized gathering. Here was an unauthorized rabbi someone who had not gone through the rabbinic school, someone who wasn't from their circles, and they felt at ease here. There were basically two religious groups at this time. You had the, the Sadducees. The Sadducees were basically liberals. They had adjusted the scriptures. They didn't believe parts of the Bible. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were legalists. And so here you have the, the soft section and the hard section. Yet at the end of the day, here they are. They're coming together and they're trying to get Jesus. And they're annoyed because he is stirring things up. People are beginning to talk. Don't we see that also today? that even amongst the religious establishment, faith is to become a private thing. Faith has never got to spill over. As soon as it becomes dangerous, as soon as it becomes revolutionary, it has to be suppressed. It has to be put down. This has always been the case. <clears throat> when preachers have spoken of liberation, when preachers have spoken about breaking the status quo, when preachers have gone right into the establishment and said, this is not the way to live, the establishment has turned on them. Folks, we often talk about Christianity as being a conservative movement. Conservative. It is nothing of the sort. The Pharisees see it here. They see what's happening here. Many people went out to meet him. The Pharisees said, verse 19, this is getting us nowhere. See how the whole world is, is following him. There was something in the teaching of Jesus which was compelling. The establishment always trying and silence the word of the Messiah. And so... Faith, as soon as it becomes dangerous, is given a label. Maybe some folk would call it fundamentalism or, or, or whatever. You take an example. Maybe a Cornerstone or some other congregation, a guy comes along and he's interested. He's, he hears the message. He realizes, whoo, th this is an interesting church. It's not just bells and smells. It's not just your normal religious religious sandwich. This is 
powerful. I'm hearing things here which are transformative. I feel that God is moving me in, in, in my life. And maybe the guy's wife will say, whoa, hold on here. You're getting in too deep here. You know, don't, don't forget about this sinner stuff. Forget about this new birth, born again stuff. You know, go for something a little bit more mainstream, a little bit more domestic. Notice how it ends. It ends with typically ironic. John, the writer of this gospel, is typically ironic because he says here, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. The Pharisees spoke more than they knew. Sure, the whole world was going after him. Everyone without racial distinction. This is the power of the gospel. We are all equal. We're all lost and in rebellion against God. We all need him. Here he is bringing all these people together. His mission was to save the world. And John's theme is Jesus as the sent one. The global reach of Christianity is absolutely jaw-dropping. According to uh, an article by Max Fisher in, in the Washington Post, he wrote of the spread of worldwide Christianity, uh, uh, and he said this, Christianity is the only religion in the world with a major presence on every continent. Amazingly, he says there are actually more Christians in the Asia-Pacific region than in Christian-dominated North America. We're seeing this just now that, you know, the whole world is beginning to get it. China, Latin America, all over the world, they're following him. Christianity is growing rapidly. They could not stop him. Look at the verse, next verse. It, it says there, now there were some Greeks among them who went up to worship at the festival. Greeks, there you are, is beyond the Jewish kind of narrow confines. Greeks are coming to follow Jesus. As we conclude, this passage is framed in the, what we call the, the Lazarus narrative. Lazarus is a man who had been set free from death. The Pharisees simply didn't realize his power. Jesus is the one who makes dead people live again. This is the Messiah who will turn a dying universe around. This is the Messiah of whom we are to bow before him today and cry, Hosanna, he is the King of Kings. And we have to follow him now and follow him forever. Will you do that this Palm Sunday? Will you be among those who recognise him for who he is and love him, not for what you can get out of him, but love him just because he is?